Hey there, welcome to or welcome back to No Pants Profits. My name is Richard and today I'm coming to you from the west coast of Florida, but slightly more specific, Fort Myers, Florida, and much more specific, the Edison Ford Winter Estates. Yes, Thomas Edison and Henry Ford had a place that they'd go when it was cold up north. And there's a lot of Edison's inventions and Ford's thinkings that have uh, that have kind of uh, found their ways here. There's a giant banyan tree here. You'll see right there, look at that guy. A big old giant tree. And we can go to the ticket office. We're gonna ticket office, get some tickets, check out together the Edison Ford Winter Estates here in uh, right by downtown Fort Myers in Florida. And uh, oh look, we got someone here. I don't know if that's Edison or Ford. We'll have to see who it is. Whether it's Edison or Ford. It's one of the old dudes. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah. There's a cafe right by the trees. I think that one's up. Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, that one. Probably Edison. Remember, it's uh, Edison, Edison, not Einstein. But yeah, this is a big banyan tree. I think I'm gonna stop by the Banyan Tree Cafe first. Maybe get some a sandwich or something like that before we um, go inside and get a ticket. But I'm gonna take you around for however long it takes. I don't know if we're gonna take our own tour. We're gonna take a guided guided tour, and uh, we'll see the Edison Ford Estate and learn some of the history. I've been here before as a kid. Very similar to the uh, Corkscrew Swamp, but um, see how it works. All right, so the next tour is at 11. Uh, your prices here are either $25 for a self-guided tour or $30 gets you the um, gets you the one with a guide. I just went with the uh, 11 o'clock guided tour right here. So, um, but for now, we're gonna go into the Edison Botanic Research Laboratory, which might be a cafe now. No, enter the other side of the building, wristband required. Laboratory vault. I don't know what any of this means. For right now, oh, there we go. I was saying for right now, I just want to grab a snack because uh, I drove here from South Florida to Southwest Florida this morning. It's about a two hour and two hour and change drive. So I'm gonna grab a snack at the cafe and then in 15 minutes, we will get started with our tour and you will follow along. I don't know if you want, see what's here. I don't really know, I don't remember. I've been here before for a wedding. I think I've been here before for that, but I just don't remember. We'll have to see. All right, so I'm headed towards the guided tour. Um, I know this is like a laboratory and stuff like that. I don't know much about this place. You're not gonna hear from me for the next little bit, once I got something to say. You're gonna hear from the guide. So um, may the force be with you and huh, whatever guide we get um, here at the Edison Ford Winter Estates, which we'll learn more about it because I've just, I've been on the property for a wedding. That's not at all, but otherwise I was here as a kid. So we'll see what there is to see. Join along. Now pick any of the flowers or fruit off the bushes or trees or up off the floor. They are part of the historical nature of our property. Now we'll be reviewing some of that history today along our track. Now I will say once we make it up to the homes here, uh, we ask that you please not sit or lean on any of the patio railing or furniture. They are original to the property. They're over 100 years old. Uh, we like to say the only thing keeping them together is the paint, which it's not untrue. <laughs> I will say though, if you ever feel the need to sit down, there are benches such as the one along the railing here up, up by the homes uh, around that area more or less. I do also want to note there are, there are two restroom facilities on our property. We have one in our pavilion, right across our banyan tree, and one on Henry Ford's property. So if the need ever arises, please feel free. We'll always regroup along our track here. I will also note, photography is allowed on our premise, though I would suggest to please stay within our group, just so that we can keep moving through the track smoothly. So as we go along our property here today, we're gonna to start off here on the museum porch, and then we'll cut through our garden center. 
will meet at Lina Edison statue at the number 21. We'll then cross over to the banyan tree here, and then from there, we'll cross McGregor, explore, kind of loop around the, the north side of the property, and once we're finished, we're gonna head through towards the homes and finish at the Ford Cottage, which has been so conveniently converted into a gift shop, because this is Florida, and all experiences are in a gift shop. <laughs> Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. Thomas Edison would establish his homes here decades prior to Henry Ford. The Edisons owned their home, homes here from 1885 all the way to 1947. Now Ford would come a little later in 1916 and own their home all the way till 1944, so still a good chunk of time. Though because the Edisons came here first, that's what we'll be speaking about first along our tour today. So in the 1880s, when Edison came to Fort Myers, I will say he was one of the most famous people in the world. He was a well-established inventor. He was kind of coming towards the end of his Menlo Park era, where he invented the phonograph, started perfecting the incandescent light bulb. Though I will say, excuse me, uh, in 1884, his first wife, Mary Stilwell, would pass. Now, Mary Stowell and Thomas Edison were married for 13 years. They would have three children, Marion, Thomas Jr., and William. Now, by the time of their mother's passing, they were all under the age of 12. Now, one fact you'll learn about Thomas Edison on our tour today, he was quite the workaholic. And so even in the months uh, after his wife's passing, he would release another, another nine patents to his own creations. So, kind of balancing out work, being a father, he knew that he had to marry quickly. Uh, to have someone to kind of get his children back on track, provide some structure. So by the time we get to the winter of 1885, well, you know, the compounding stress, you kind of want to relax a little bit. So Thomas Edison and his friend Ezra Gilman decide, we're going to leave the New Jersey winter behind us, we're going to take a vacation down to Florida, and so they head down to St. Augustine. Now, unfortunately for them, it was one of the coldest winters on record in St. Augustine in 1885. So the frost didn't suit them. They decided, let's go on an even longer tour of Florida and explore the wild brush here. Now, they would take a carriage, a train, circle towards the upper east coast of Florida, loop around, come back to the west coast to the Tampa area, they would rent out a schooner, then sail down the west coast and make it to a port town called Punto Rasa, which is by the Sanibel area today. From there, they would rent a second boat, sail down the Caloosahatchee River, and make their way here to Fort Myers. Now with that, I'll we'll ask you to... Uh, I'm standing in the sun now, you'll feel okay, but an hour later, not so much. <laughs> And so then I'd like to say here that Thomas Edison, though he was a formidable man, he was not this large. Uh, in reality, Thomas Edison stood around 5A, which is around an inch taller than me. This statue is called a heroic statue. It's about 20% larger than the actual figures themselves. And we have three on our premise. We have one of Thomas Edison, one of Mina Edison, and one of Henry Ford along his property there. But dwarfing a heroic statue is a beautiful banyan tree. Now this is one tree, and it is one of the largest banyan trees in the continental U.S., and it takes up approximately three quarters of an acre. Now how this tree grows, now if you see off to my right here, this vine-like aerial root, so those roots grow out of the branches. They'll make their way all the way down until they fasten themselves into the soil. There, they'll grow thick into pillar roots and eventually become these auxiliary trunks, which gives it its nickname, the walking tree. It kind of looks like it's taken a stroll. But I will say this tree was planted in 1927, standing at four feet tall, about two and a half inches in diameter. And it is a remnant of Edison's rubber research here in Fort Myers. So I'm gonna jump forward into history a little bit until after World War One. After World War One, well, rubber prices soared. Uh, rubber imports from South America and Southeast Asia, well, 
there's a bit of a question of how uh, efficient we were able to import rubber during that time. And so then everyone began to wonder, what would the U.S. do if we could no longer get our imported, our imported rubber? So Edison wanted to answer that question. So Thomas Edison, as well as his friends Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone, each invested $25,000 to create the Edison Botanical Research Corporation. Now their goal was to try and find a domestic source of rubber that can be used in a, I guess, in a time of crisis that the U.S. desperately needed rubber. So here along the property, so if you see off to my left, where the parking lot is now, Edison and his team had rectangular research plots. In those plots, they would test around 2,222 different species of plants to see which one could perhaps create... I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of a... a <laughs> Uh, how do you say? External notes by our birds up here. But, and so then, in testing out so many different species, they were trying to find the one plant that could create or generate enough latex uh, to be manufactured into rubber. In his rubber laboratory across our museum store here, in that rectangular building, they would test 17,000 different samples. But as they whittled away, they found their golden ticket, or I should say, the golden rod. Now, some of you may be familiar with the golden rod. It is a weed, but that's one thing Edison liked about it. It grew fast, it grew hardy, and it grew dense, so it would last through the season. And so then Edison and his team had hybridized the golden rod to grow around 10 to 12 feet high. They would call that hybridized uh, golden rod Sol Solidago Edisoniana, after the inventor himself. Now, in part, the reason why they had it grow so high is because it generated a lot of leaves. And so in those leaves is where they found that latex and were able to manufacture it into rubber. Now, though with this feat and whatnot, I will say, his rubber research was the last major project that Edison would work on. In 1931, Edison would pass and research would slow. Um, it wouldn't slow just simply because of his passing, the event invention of artificial rubber during that time also kind of put a damper on things. So by 1937, the corporation dissolved, and by 1940, all the research would be handed over towards the federal government. But yes, I will say, does anyone have any questions on Edison's rubber research down here, or Banyan, or our statue here? So very interestingly, uh, you actually have to cross a pretty big highway to get over to uh, where the actual houses are. This is just where the uh, lab was, back here. That's the rubber lab, right back there. And we have to actually cross McGregor, which turned into a pretty big highway. Uh, but this was Edison's second wife, right here, who actually sold the um, property to the city of Fort Myers. There were under 400 residents in the city of Fort Myers um, when they, uh, under 400 residents in the city of Fort Myers when the Edisons moved here. And now Fort Myers is, yeah, just, just a couple million, I think. So you have to get your ticket before you go across here. I mean, I guess they made sure there's a pretty efficient crosswalk, but over here is where the actual, um, where the actual grounds are of the estates of uh, Edison and Ford. So, we'll see what's over here. We have crossed the street. I'll return you to the next clip to the tour. The tour is about 20 people or so here. So, let's continue. And then I will return you in the next clip to the tour. Amelia Bush here is original to the property. It was planted by Mina Edison. Now, though this is quite a large spe a specimen, I would say, it is only a fraction of its original size. At one point, this bucambelia reached the height of one of our homes here in the distance. After Hurricane Irma in 2017, about two-thirds of it had been chopped down. So you see this unruly kind of mess of branches. That's just our staff trying to bring it back to its former glory. I should say back to Edison. <laughs> And so when Edison made that trip down here in 1885 with that friend, Ezra Gilland, he fell absolutely in love. 
He loved the grit. He loved the isolation of this area and found it a respite from the glitz and glamour of the Northeast. And so then Thomas Edison and that friend Ezra Gilliland would make a deal. Thomas Edison would buy the 13 acres here on the property while Gilliland would buy the neighboring four acres so that they could be kind of wintering neighbors more or less. Yes. I will say Thomas Edison had also bought this property by a man called Samuel Summerlin. Does that name kind of ring a bell? Here there is a Summerlin Road and it's named after the same namesake. The Summerlins were originally the cattle barons of this town that helped settle the Fort Myers area. I will say Thomas Edison did buy this land for around $2,750, which if you ask me, that's a pretty good deal for riverfront access here in Florida. But considering the Summerlins bought this property originally for $150, well, it's pretty steep. But Edison, considering who he was, was more than content with himself. So if you'll follow me, we're going to head toward the Orchid Grove off here by our moonlight garden. Now that garden was actually designed by one of the first garden architects in the U.S. called Ellen Biddle. Now this is the only garden on our premise that is closed off, that isn't as open to the rest of the property. It was designed to kind of facilitate a room, uh, kind of surrounded by this brush to feel more or less enclosed and, and kind of comforted by the nature surrounding it. I will say the reason why it's called the Moonlight Garden is because it really does take a life of its own once the night, once the sun goes down. That reflection pool that you see does reflect the moonlight, but more importantly are the plants surrounding it. Many of them only bloom or become fragrant at night. So commonly once the flowers are blooming and the fragrance is in the air, Maya would take her social hours here with any friends or family visiting them here in Fort Myers. And so then at this time I want to point out the structure to the left of me. Now this kind of cottage-like style on the left was Edison, the Edison's caretaker's cottage, and this extension was added later to serve as their three-car garage and chauffeur's quarters up on top there. But when Edison first bought this property, there was not much here. There was some sable palm, bamboo, brush, and this cottage here. This originally served as a rest stop for those cattle ranchers moving down Riverside Ave, just to have a place to kind of rest, some shelter um, overhead. So I will say it is one of the oldest standing buildings here in Fort Myers. It is reminiscent of the Cracker style house, Cracker, alluding to the sounding of the whip as those cattle ranchers were moving their cattle. But today, the two buildings have been converted, one, to our art gallery area and our garage to our education center. I will have, uh, kind of have a funny aside, I would say, to our garage area here. Now, Edison was gifted two Model Ts from his friend Henry Ford down here in Fort Myers, and then he had a third car, a Lincoln, which, uh, funny enough, he actually preferred the Lincoln, if anything. <laughs> But I will say before he had a chauffeur down here with him, uh, Thomas Edison and his son Charles would drive their own cars from time to time. Specifically, Charles really did help manage uh, starting up and keeping care of the Model T's. But one day they're out on the drive and they almost get into a car accident. And after that, Thomas Edison, well, he was okay with his driving experience from that point. And so the, from then they would bring down a chauffeur with them on their trips. But does anyone have any questions wired with electricity? Now, Edison would ensure that this property was uh, wired with electricity. Now, they originally, he had placed a steam dynamo uh, next to his electrical laboratory. Now, this was the first area or first property that had any sense of illumination or electricity here in Fort Myers. So when he had powered on that dynamo for the first time, those 300 or so uh, people in Fort Myers came down here to the Edison property to celebrate and see this incredible event of the light bulbs turning on for the first time. Though I also do want to note a couple of different features here in this area. One is the bamboo. Now though, th now though there wasn't much here, one thing that truly intrigued Edison was the bamboo. 
Now, in the 1880s, Edison had been working towards perfecting the incandescent light bulb. He had been experimenting with carbonized bamboo fiber to serve as the filament inside the light bulb. Now, the filament is that curly Q in the bulb that provides the illumination. He found that the bamboo fiber could burn for around 1,200 hours. So for commercialization's sake, that's pretty good. Edison would eventually use the metal tungsten that would burn for around 1,800 hours. But I always find it rather impressive that a natural substitute could have uh, served as his commercial success. But if you'll accompany me here, we're going to head closer towards the pool area here. I usually like to say, uh, please enjoy the million dollar view here. <laughs> Originally, when Edison and Ezra Gillen made that deal, You'll have Edison's main vacationing house, the building closest to us, and Gilliland's property in his home would be that house farthest from us there. Now, if you notice that these two homes kind of look similar, it's because they are. They are the same structure, just mirrored in on each other. Originally in 1885, when Edison bought this property, he was riding that high, finally finding his wintering home. So he was helping going through designing how he wanted his property to look. He would eventually employ Boston architect Alden Frank to help design his homes. Now they are, de they are designed in the Queen Anne style, which was quite popular in the 1880s. Now eventually Edison and Frank would decide that the easiest way to build their homes, they would hire a custom framing company up in Maine to pre-cut the homes. They would send them on six barges all the way down from Maine, go around the peninsula of Florida, and offload here on the Edison dock to then be built up here. Now they did that for a number of reasons. One, he was Edison. He was, <laughs> he was able to do that uh, on his own right, even with his notoriety, you know, might as well do it for Edison. Second being, there were not enough skilled craftsmen here in Florida, and trying to track down supplies or craftsmen from anywhere else, it was going to be quite the trek to go through Florida there. But at this time, if you'll accompany, we're going to start heading up onto the patio, catching some shade. Home. 
Now the Dynamo here on the property of Roswell Water Company pumping stations were here on Edison's property. When he caught wind that Gillen wanted to come back down here to Fort Myers, he called up or telegraphed to his caretaker, said, I do not want Gillen to come on my dock or use any of my utilities here on the property. I will say Gillen, well, he took the hint. He would eventually sell his wintering home to Ambrose McGregor, CEO of Standard Oil at that time, probably one of the wealthiest men in the world considering. Um, it wouldn't be until 1906 where the Edisons were able to buy back those four acres, and that's what kind of jettisons that time of remodeling and additions made. But if you'll follow me, we're going to start exploring and heading through the breezeway here and coming around the building. Here's a pretty cool, uh, cool random thing. They've got a light switch here that's original to the Edison property, and you can actually that lights on and all. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't do anything anymore, but that's an original light switch to this property right here. Pretty cool. You know what? Let's extend it to 14 feet. Now, with that would come the awning, as well as the inclusion of these French doors. 
Now, if you see these kind of awkward boards descending from the ceiling there, that's where the original doors and windows were to these homes. Now, the combination of the patio, the awning, and these doors, it actually creates a natural AC system through the home. A kind of draft circulates through the home, which allows us to keep all of the original furniture shown inside. Because of that draft, it keeps any mold or mildew away from the furniture in there. Yes. I thought that was ingenious, I would say, coming from a native Floridian to have that insight, <laughs> even through the winter time. But yes, but as we start to um, conclude the Edison homes here, we're going to start making our way down to the Henry Ford property. Here until 1914, Thomas Edison would invite Ford to come down to Fort Myers to then head out onto a camping trip in Big Cypress, which is a park right outside the Florida Everglades, though I will say it's just as swampy and it's just as wet. Now they would be joined by naturalist and writer John Burroughs during that camping trip. Now before they headed out, it was decided that each, re each respective family for each of these gentlemen would be joining them on this camping trip as well. So what was supposed to last for around a little over a week in Big Cypress only lasted three days. Three days of continuous rain, mud, and continuous interactions with snakes and the like. <laughs> and so they decided to come back here to their lodge, but afterward those three gentlemen decided or silently knew that they had bonded and made a friendship for the rest of their lives. Uh, we have a, uh, how would you say, a gallery in our museum called Into the Wilds, which actually reviews some of more of their camping trips through the 20th century. That would also include Harvey Firestone as well. But if you'll follow me, we'll start heading towards the Ford property. We're just going to initially duck into the car exhibit here just to catch a little bit more. The Ford Motor Company would not be established until 1903 after a number of different failures or business ventures uh, during the early, uh, late 1890s. But in 1903, he would first shut off with the Model A, and he would kind of work his way down alphabetically until he found the model that stuck. And that's where we get the Model T in 1908. So here in our garage, we have a number of different Ford models. We have our Model T in the upper right here. We have two Model T pickup trucks, and on the other side here is a 1929 Model A sedan. Now I will say, a large or main point in Ford's kind of business venture is that he wanted to create a vehicle that the everyday man could afford. So in 1908, a new Model T would cost around $850. But by 1927, when it had finished being manufactured and sold, it only costed $260 to buy a brand new Model T. Now, the reason why he was able to cut down the price was the introduction of the assembly line. I will say Henry Ford did not invent the assembly line, but he definitely did perfect it. What used to take 13 hours to create one Model T would only take 93 minutes to complete one car. By the time they had finished being manufactured, there were around 15 million Model Ts here on U.S. roads. I also do have a couple of different facts about the models in here. So here, our Model T pickup truck. Now, do you know why we call them pickup trucks? So you can pick things up? So, well, what the, for, so you can pick things 
up, but not only that, you have to pick up your own pickup truck at either the boat dock or train station. Originally, it would come in a crate. The only thing that would come assembled were the metal components, such as this metal area here in the chassis. The rest was up to you. So I would say this is more or less an American Ikea situation. People would use different kinds of wood to create the kind of uh, compartment and bed there. They would use reclaimed barn wood, wood from the crate itself. So there is a saying that no two Model T pickup trucks are ever the same. And we have a nice little variety here in our garage. I will also say, we have this 1929 Model A. Now I sometimes get the question, I just said a Model A was in 1903. What is this? Model A. So I will say the Ford Motor Company is a family company. I think they're looking for me. Uh -huh. But what is this Model A in 1929? Now the Ford Company has always been a family company. It still is today. Though by the time we get to the 1920s, Henry Ford's only son, Edsel Ford, started working for the company. Now, he would approach his father and say, you know what, we kind of need to streamline, modernize, and get with the times. So that's how we get this Model A here, trying to kind of kickstart a new era. I will also say, to create some context, now the 1920s, that was the time of the Prohibition. And so then a huge difference between the Model T and Model A, on a good day, the Model T could get up to around 45 miles per hour, while the Model A, could get up to 65 miles per hour. So a lot of bootleggers appreciated a well-built Ford trying to make their next shipment do their job. I will also say another funny aside, that infamous duo, Bonnie and Clyde, also used a Ford. In fact, Clyde had even written a thank you letter to Ford appreciating his well-built vehicle that he could go off on his different excursions. But if you're following your area here, please feel free to walk through and explore this area. I will say between these two gentlemen, uh, Ford and Edison, Edison was the senior of the two. There's about a 16 year age difference between them. And I will say though the friendship started out as a mentorship, they would grow quite close over time. They originally met in 1896 at a convention. Edison had been introduced to Henry Ford, or vice versa, Ford had been introduced to Edison as the man who built the, excuse me, the quadricycle. Now, I will say this is the first iteration of an automobile, though it was essentially four bike tires hitched onto an engine. Though, not to say the least, Edison was quite impressed instead of seeing this young man as a potential rival, he would motivate Ford to continue on his inventions, and from then on, they would grow quite close with time. I will say Ford's property here was much more to stay in proximity of his friend rather than explore the wilds of Florida. Now, the opportunity would also come to Ford to buy this property here. Now, this home was built in 1911. It was originally owned by New York entrepreneur Robert Smith. Now, by 1916, Robert Smith was considering to sell his home. Now, about a couple of years prior, on that camping trip, he saw Ford here in Fort Myers. So he decides to write a letter saying, you know what, I saw you down here a couple of years ago, and I know you're great friends with uh, Thomas Edison. Would you want to buy my home down there in Fort Myers? And Henry Ford said, you know what? Sure. So he would find his home for $20,000. I will say there are a number of different differences between the Edison's home and this one here, one being the material. Now the Edison's home was built up at, out of that main soft pine, which doesn't do too well in the humidity here, has a number of problems with bugs and whatnot, so I will say uh, the homes are mainly original, just because of the provenance of the property, they've been able to be upkept well. Now this home here is built out of Florida pine. With sands of humidity and fire thrives in it, and it's also termite resistant, so it has no problems with the bugs, and now, you know, it's kind of uh, good on its
it's all more or less. Another difference, if you see the interior of Ford's homes here, the furniture inside is not original to the property. Now in part, in 1931, after Thomas Edison's passing, Henry Ford had a very difficult time coming back down here to Fort Myers, kind of reliving those memories with his beloved friend. The last time he was here at this home was in 1935, but the last time he visited Fort Myers in 1940, he started renting out this home and got a hotel room in downtown Fort Myers. The car company at that time wanted that edge and wanted to be the first to get to that V8. So working on it down here in his home in Fort Myers, it was kind of a reprieve away from onlooking eyes or competitive whispers. He was so secretive about it, his family almost didn't know he had been working on it during their vacations down here. Yes. And then I also want to point out our beautiful Mysore fig tree. Now this is also not native uh, to Florida. It is shipped in from India, I believe. Now if you see that beautiful extensive root system, I will say the roots only reach around 9 to 12 inches into the soil. Now the reason why it's lasted through all these hurricanes and storms is just because of how vast that system has built in on itself that it's able to balance out that top weight of the tree. Yes, I do also get questions considering it's a fig tree. It does produce fruit, though it is not edible. I do not recommend it. <laughs> yes, but does anyone have any questions about these two gentlemen or the properties here? Well then, I would like to thank you so much for accompanying me on my tour today. I do want to leave you with a couple of reminders. In our cottage, there's water, there's ice cream, there's AC. So if you feel the need to cool down a little bit after our tour, I feel free or I welcome you to kind of explore our cottage area inside. Your band gives you access to the property until 5.30 today. So even if you want to leave, get a bite to eat, come back, please feel free to do so. Yes, but thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you. Oh, of course, yes. All right, so that was a uh, cute guided tour. Lasted, uh, what time is it now? An hour, 20 minutes? Yeah, about an hour, 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to go back and explore with you the um, museum, which has some old Fords in it. And then we'll go back and we'll check out the rubber workshop. And then we'll wrap it up for this tour. I will tell you, uh, I'm an idiot. Uh, I wasn't watching my fingers exactly. Wanted a Gatorade, the vending machine. Got myself a Diet Coke. I don't drink Diet Coke. So um, the good news is I got a fridge in the back of my truck. So the good news is, you know, if you see me, the next few months, if you want a Diet Coke, I probably have one. Oh no, I'm just not a uh, aspartine, aspartame fan. We do have to recross McGregor Road, which you learned was named for McGregor, or this one's not McGregor. Yeah, this is McGregor. Named for McGregor, who lived on the property. Uh, but I will see you back across the street where we started at the museum and the uh, rubber fact rubber rubber factory rubber rubber laboratory and I'll wrap it over there all right so we are in the museum now which is not part of the uh, tour that's a Ford coupe model T another one Cadillac Ooh. other Ford you know how the Ford logo hasn't changed and a very, very, very long time. Looks exactly like it did back in the day. 1914 prices. Look at that. 500 I don't know. Oh, if only cars still cost $500. Welcome to inflation. And then this is a lot of Edison's uh, electric generators and things like that. Some electric pen and autograph press. Entire copying system that hopefully makes duplication of documents much easier for banks. Oh, look at that. It's like a photocopier. This is the Dynamo. 
This is how they got power here. This is something that looks like that thing. More power. Direct current. Yeah. See, see AC versus DC. Just kind of a funny scenario these days. Time point of innovation. There's a there's an Edison. End of the wild. Oh, there's air conditioning in here. Also, there's bite marks. Hmm. That's how bite marks. This thing was bitten into by Edison as he continued to improve his invention. And then family exhibit laboratory. So we can go this way and actually see the laboratory. Oh, wow. That's some pretty uh, calliope on the back of it. Yeah, there is a calliope on the back of it. Pretty cool that there's a calliope on the back. Uh, all kinds of other Edison creations here. The Calliope is pretty cool. He's got the gloves on. You got something cool that you can touch with the gloves? <laughs> There's a bunch of cameras. Those are all, it's a combination of Edison Ford stuff. What the hell is that? That's one big ass Edison. Yeah, that's Edison. A sculpture of Thomas Edison, yeah. That is an Edison. 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 Solar power. Kind of random. Edison and rubber. This is the uh, rubber museum. Rubber round. Latex. All our stuff like that. And I believe to the laboratory. So this is Edison's actual rubber laboratory. The last thing that he, uh, last thing he pretty much made before he died was invest looking at all alternate uh, plants for rubber in case they couldn't get rubber from foreign countries. And I remember this when I was a kid. Oh yeah, I remember all this. And I remember going on a tour and you were to walk through this. Well, this is like Edison's actual rubber processing factory and all the machines up there would run on a machine that was running on the outside. There's a dark room. I guess that was for taking photographs and stuff like that. We're gonna head out right this way. So, as we head back towards the giant banyan tree. This is Richard from No Pants Profits. Gave you a nice little look at um, the Ford and Edison winter estates, where Edison spent a lot of time, and Ford just came down for like two weeks or so a year around Edison's birthday. Um, they were 16, 16 years apart, but uh, Edison was Ford's senior. So back from where we started at the Panion Tree, back with the hero statue of Thomas Edison. This is Richard from No Pants Profits. And some dude taking pictures of Edison's ass. Oh, that's a, let's see. Yeah. Reminding you that when you wear no pants, the only thing you got left to lose is your shirt. See you around? Bye!